Okay, class. Today we're going to start with Chapter 7, which is called Tracking the Macroeconomy. And when we say tracking, what we really mean is measuring. And it's these measurements that really help us to separate out microeconomics from macroeconomics. So be sure you pay attention and uh, make sure you really try and understand the concepts here. There's not a lot of math, but there's a lot of vocab that you guys should really have down pat. Uh, and as always, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. So what I'd like to start with is a motivating example. This is just something I want you all to have in the back of your mind as we're learning this to try and figure out, you know, what this really means and, and how you should be thinking about it. So it's a simple uh, thought experiment that we're doing. Uh, would you guys rather live here or here? And I'm going to show you these one more time. So, so would you rather live here or here? This is beautiful Costa Rica, and this is Houston, obviously in America. And the thing is, uh, people in Houston, and Amer Americans, tend to be much wealthier on average than Costa Ricans. But Costa Rica tends to have the happiest people on, on the planet. So as we, as we go forward, uh, and we talk about how well an economy is doing, we tend to be more talking about this than this. And that's just something I, I want you guys to keep in mind as we go forward. So as I said, Americans are wealthier than Costa Ricans. But how do we know this for sure? What most countries do is they keep track of their national accounts. You might have heard of these by some other names. There's the national income accounts, income and product accounts, and national income accounting. And uh, they keep track of what we want to know about these macroeconomies. Uh, just for fun, does anyone know who, who keeps track of the national accounts in America? No, that's a good guess. Not the Fed. It's actually the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is part of the Commerce Department. So, y'all remember this diagram, right? The circular flow? I showed it to you? Well, when I first showed it to you, I was lying a bit. Remember what I told you guys, all economists are lying. In this case, it's because the circular flow diagram is actually a little more complicated. It looks more like this. And I don't know if you guys can see it on the back, but what we did here is we added financial markets, the government, and the rest of the world. Remember, we're talking about the macro economy here, so most of the time we're dealing with countries. Um, so previously, the way people made money is by selling their labor or renting their capital in the factor markets. But now, there, are, as you guys know, there are other ways people make money, uh, non-labor ways, non-capital non ways. For example, you guys or your parents might own stocks or bonds. Those transactions take place in the financial market. You can see uh, private savings leading uh, from households into the financial market. Other people uh, get um, transfers from the government sometimes. And sometimes they give transfers to the government. We just had a big government transfer day, tax day. Uh, so that's uh, taxes going out from households to the government and sometimes it comes back to you. Uh, so there's all this money that's flowing around the economy, uh, but we need a way to measure it. And that's where uh, these national accounts come in. That's where what we're going to learn about today comes in, and that's called GDP, or gross domestic product. And this is just one sentence on this slide because it's really important. You guys need to write it down. Uh, but gross domestic product, or GDP, is the total value of all final goods and services produced in an economy during a given period of time, which is usually a year. Um, now you guys might be asking, why do we have the word final here? And what that does is it prevents double counting. Uh, if I buy some lettuce and use it to make a sandwich and then sell you that sandwich, the lettuce doesn't count, that's an intermediate good. And you guys will see this more 
in a little bit in a few slides. But uh, can I stop here? Any questions? No. Okay. So the the fact that it's all final goods and services produced in the economy uh, presents us with a really simple way to calculate it. And that first way is to just survey all the firms and ask what the value of their final uh, final goods sales were. But as simple as that sounds, in practice it's not that easy. There's a lot of firms in any given country and surveys are not necessarily the most accurate. Firms might want to say they made more or less depending on, on uh, you know, various signals it might send. So we need some other ways um, to calculate it. Now you might be asking, what does this have to do with the circular flow diagram? Well, do you remember our counting rule from when we first learned about circular flow? It was that flows out of any box have to equal flows into any box. Uh, so if our definition for GDP is total value of all final goods and services produced in the economy, we can just check flows in or out of the market for goods and services. We call this uh, measure aggregate spending. But we can also look at this side of the, the circular flow diagram. Factor markets. What is the uh, total value that firms are spending on factors of production? That's, you know, wage, rental rates for capital, sometimes it includes uh, interest payments. So here, we're looking at GDP as a measure of total income. And both those ways are, are, are fine to have. Uh, so, so far we've had three ways to calculate GDP. We've surveyed firms directly uh, and asked them about their, their final production values. We've added up aggregate spending. That's over here in the markets for goods and services. And we've summed the total factor income paid to households. That's here in the factor market. Any questions about this? Now some of you, either because you're old enough or because you've read older papers, might have heard the term gross national product as opposed to gross domestic product. And we don't really study that anymore. But there's an interesting story that might be apocryphal that the rest of the world said, Look, United States, we use GDP, you use GNP, um, and we're going to give you two choices. You can either start using GDP, or you can switch to the metric system. And so the United States uses GDP now. Like I said, I think that's apocryphal, but it's a nice little uh, story. So you guys have learned these three ways to calculate GDP. Survey firms directly, figure out aggregate spending, or figure out total income. Now let's go through a simple example uh, to help you calculate it. So here is a simple example of the US economy. If any of you guys can't see the slide, uh, it's okay because this I just took out of your book. It's recreated in chapter seven. Uh, so we consider that the US economy has three firms. Here it's United States ore. Ore is what you use to make steel. United States Steel, which comes next, and Ford Motor Company. And in this year, Ford sold one car that was worth $21,500. So the first question that, that we've dealt with today is, why do we only consider final goods? Well, like I said, we want to avoid double counting. And if you're Ford, how do you make cars? you make them out of steel. So you don't want the, the steel that Ford uses in this car to be counted in GDP. Because uh, it's already included in the final sale price of this car. So the first way we had to calculate GDP was to add up the final uh, value of all or the, the goods and services produced in the economy. And here there was only one final good and service produced, and that was this car. So in this simple example, United States GDP is 21500 
Uh, but remember, we can also consider value added. Uh, value added is just the value of a firm's sales minus the amount they spend on intermediate goods. So US ore, they don't use any intermediate goods. They just take the ore out of the ground. But US steel, they use ore to make their steel. And Ford uses US steel to make their cars. So here, uh, we, we calculate the value added. 4,200 minus zero is 4,200, obviously. 9,000 minus 4,200, that's 4,800. And then you take the car, 21,500, and subtract the $9,000 worth of steel in it, you get 12,500. So each of these cells represents the value added to the economy by that firm. Then we just sum it across and get the GDP that way. So 4,200 plus 4,800 plus 12,500 should equal what we got for GDP before, which is 21,500. Go ahead and add it up on your own and let me know what you guys get. 21,500, right? Well, that's exactly what we got for, for US GDP. This is great stuff, and it lets us know that our accounting rules work. Any questions so far? All right, I know it might be a little tedious to go through this a couple different ways, but on the test, I'm gonna be asking you guys to do this more than one way. So, so make sure you know all the ways we can calculate GDP. Now there's one last way we can figure out GDP. Does anyone remember it from the previous slide? Right, total factor income. And here factor means factors of production, which we see in these cells under intermediate goods. There's wages, interest payments, rent, and profit. Now, I've already summed them up for you across these cells. The total value of wages was 15,700. That's coming from each of these three firms. Total value of interest, that uh, was 1,600 plus 1,000, 2,600. Rent, pretty simple to add up, 200, 300, and 500 is 1,000. And profit is 1,000 plus 200 plus 1,000, which is 2,200. So now I want you guys to go ahead at your desks and sum down these cells and see if total factor income, the total factor payments, equals GDP. Okay, you guys all done? Well, I had 15,700 plus 2,600 plus 1,000 plus 2,200 here, and I got 21,500 again. So this is great. It means our accounting rules work. It means we have consistent measures of GDP across the board. And it means if for whatever reason we uh, are uncertain in our numbers, we have a great way to double check. Any questions? Okay, so I just want to go back real quick and remind you, here are the three ways to calculate GDP. You survey firms directly, you add up aggregate spending, or you sum the total factor income. And does anyone remember the definition of GDP? I had you guys write it down earlier. That's right, it's the total value of all final goods and services produced in an economy during a given year. Okay, any more questions? All right, guys, well, it seems like we're just about out of time, but I want to give you a real quick heads up about what we're doing next time. Next time we have to finish up Chapter 7. So we're going to learn about the different components of GDP. Uh, we're going to learn about various ways you measure price, price measures. And we're going to discuss real versus nominal GDP. And that's real important, because remember, guys, we talked about the classical dichotomy in economics, and that's the difference between real and nominal variables. Alright, I hope everyone has a great weekend, and I'll see you on, on Tuesday.